A lot of us have heard it. If you pray for it, it will happen. If you pray for it hard enough, and if you will believe, it will happen. I heard this over and over as a kid, and at one point, it almost destroyed my faith. The lesson today about the unjust judge is one of those stories that people telling us pray and it will happen will point to and then say, you just have to pray harder. There was a judge and Jesus says he didn't care a whit about anyone but himself, but there was also this widow. And Jesus speaks of this widow who wouldn't stop pestering the judge for justice until finally this horrible man says enough and gives her justice. And why, Jesus says, would God not do the same if we bother God enough? And so the lesson says we must pray always and not lose heart. And thus those who quote it echo the lines by saying, you just need to pray harder. But obviously, we know the problem. There are so many things we pray for that do not happen. I prayed for my grandfathers to live and my grandmothers. I prayed for dogs that were lost to return that did not. I prayed at the age of 28 for one of my best friends to not die from the cancer that had ravaged him. Prayed for us to not go to war. Prayed for the average temperature on this planet to not go up every single freaking year. Prayed for people to treat each other decently. Prayed for our nation to know peace, for people to see beyond the color of skin or political affiliation. Prayed for the Vikings to win one Super Bowl, just one, Lord. I prayed for literally every friend of the many I buried, unless they were killed before I could or simply dropped dead, to get better. Prayed for so many things, so many things that did not happen. And yet there are still those who would point to this lesson and say, well, you must not have prayed hard enough. And to those people I say, well, children might be listening. A lot of folks, when they preach on this passage, don't say anything like this. They get all involved in the particulars of the verses, the somewhat confusing language, and coax us, frankly, to sleep, which can be a preacher's best weapon when up against a difficult passage. But they end up ignoring the fact that this scripture, it could make you question the Bible and even your own faith. Maybe those preachers are smarter than me <laughs> or justifiably afraid. But one of the great lessons I've learned from the many that my father-in-law, Pastor Fritz Foltz, has taught me is that being a hypocrite about the faith or being dishonest about the faith or scripture for the sake of comfort or avoiding conflict is unacceptable. What kind of God would want that? This passage raises questions that need to be addressed. First, how did Jesus feel about prayer and life? Well, Jesus said the rain falls on the good and the evil. Basically, good and evil happen to everyone. Obviously, if that's happening, the prayers of the quote-unquote good aren't always getting answered the way they would want them answered. Jesus is saying life is beyond our control, and we have to accept that. But that seems to be in conflict with today's story. Tradition, by the way, holds pretty securely the idea that Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, was dead by the time of Jesus' public ministry. Now, can we imagine Jesus not praying for Joseph? Wouldn't the prayers of the divine human Christ be a little more powerful than ours? Did Jesus not pray hard enough? We think John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, but he died. Do we really, really think that 
Jesus wanted to see that horror realized? Remember the rich young man who came to Jesus saying, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, oh, you only lack one thing. Give everything you have to the poor and follow me. And the guy couldn't do it. And Jesus mourned because he loved him. Wasn't Jesus, in a sense, praying for that man? A straightforward reading of this passage can be problematic. We all know the crushing feeling of praying, hoping, longing for God to make something right that doesn't come to be. Plus, we see evidence in the scripture that Jesus knew very well that life's not that simple. So, what to make of it? Well, first maybe we need to hold the feet of our dear father Martin Luther to the fire a little bit. You know, Luther said quite famously by scripture alone. But that's largely been misunderstood. Luther said this in response to the corrupt papacy that existed in his time. But I doubt even Luther understood the depth of the need to also under understand our faith through tradition, through reason, and through interpretation. A truth that is abundantly evident as he uses all three in his own brilliant writings. Luther, like us, probably tended to underplay the fact that his own interpretation of things as a human being played an enormous role in his approach to God. So yeah, Luther might have said by scripture alone, but the Apocrypha, which is still part of the Catholic Bible, is gone now, thanks to him. And it was scripture when he came into the sea. Likewise, the book of James would likely be gone if good sense and perhaps his friends had not intervened. Second, I think we need to see scripture for what it is. And I actually have a prop. Look at the screen. What do you see? Okay, now, this is truth. Do this in your mind or do it with your hand. Take a finger and point to the truth. Okay? Now, ask yourself, is this finger the truth? Of course it's not. It's simply pointing to the truth. My friends, the Bible is not God. Not God, not God, not. It is a finger pointing at the truth, pointing at God. And sometimes it does a better job of pointing at God than others. This parable only shows up in one place in the Bible, in Luke. When that happens, we have to ask ourselves, did Jesus say it? If so, why is it not in the other Gospels? Or did Jesus say a different version of it than Luke heard? Or is there something in the parable that Jesus would have wanted there that does not appear in Luke? We honestly don't know. And again, I'm just being honest. There's no way to tell. We just don't know, and it's good to remember that as we struggle with the question of what does God do with our prayers. But even as we struggle, and sometimes we all do, I'll tell you what I think in faith as best as I can. It really starts with what Jesus tells us when the disciples ask, Lord, teach us to pray. Think of the Lord's Prayer, a model of Christian prayer. What does it ask? Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. The palpable presence of God in our lives and community. Thy will be done, that life might be will, lived in all of its facets, the way God wants it to be lived. And we pray for our daily needs, that they might be fulfilled for our daily bread. And finally, we pray that we might be forgiving as we are forgiven. Of course, that's not all of it. And Jesus also prayed for healing, for strength, for his friends, and we see over and over again those prayers answered in the scriptures. But 
we also see in Holy Week that he prayed that the cup of the cross might pass from him. And that did not happen. When we pray, I do think there is always a result. I know that I've been carried through life by the prayers of others at times. I know too many people who have gone through trauma who can tell me that they felt the prayers of others. And like you, I've seen the incredible and the unexpected, and it seems to have come through prayer. Prayer always has an effect, but life is also life, and life happens. And for Christians to pretend we can control it by controlling God through prayer is both destructive and counter to the complete teaching of Jesus we see revealed in the Gospel. In the end, prayer is good for us. And in faith, I will always say this about it. God hears us. God cries with us. God rejoices with us. God strengthens us, embeds the Holy Spirit in us as we pray, cry, suffer, rejoice, exalt, grow, die and rise again with every passing day. In prayer, we lay our lives at the heart of God. And as always, God cares for us there in ways that far surpass the mere understanding of life and death on this planet, even when we don't realize it. And yes, I take that from Scripture, but I also take it from life, tradition, the faith of friends, and the dwelling of the Spirit in my heart, in your heart, and in our church. We pray, and sometimes what we want doesn't happen. But God is there, God has heard, and God will bring us light, even in the darkness. I believe that even in the greatest darkness, there will be an emergence of eternal light, even when that light must shine beyond this world.